but good evening everyone and welcome to the Hudson Area Library. I'm Emily Schmidis, I'm the Library Director and I'm filling in for our History Room Coordinator, Brenda Schiefeld, who some of you may know, uh, who usually hosts our local history speaker series. Um, I'm joined by Sue Griffinport, other staff members. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Um, and I want to let you know a little bit about the Hudson Area Library History Room for anyone who has not had a chance to visit. We hope you will. It's open in the library on Saturdays from 10 a.m. till 1 p.m. or by appointment if you can't make it in on a Saturday. Um, and it houses a collection that pertains to the history of the city of Hudson, the town of Greenport, um, town of Stockport, as well as the county and New York State. Um, you can check out our History Room website which is historyroom.hudsonarealibrary.org to view images, documents, learn a little bit more about our collections and programs. Um, and we also have two new websites featuring our oral history collections that we hope you will check out. You can get to those from our History Room website. And there's also a handout on the little table by the entrance that has those written out in QR codes to get to them as well. Um, so we hope you'll check those out. If you would like to make a donation to the History Room, there's also a bin by the door um, that will help us continue to do archiving work, provide free, free programming, um, and build our collections. We have two upcoming virtual webinars that might be of interest to you. Both are offered in collaboration with the Columbia County Libraries Association and the Martin Van Buren National Historic Site. So they're both on Zoom. Uh, the first is this coming Monday, November 14th at 6 p.m., and it's on Martin Van Buren's Politics of Slavery. The second is next month, Monday, December 12th at 6 p.m., and we'll focus on Lyndon Wall's amazing, historically accurate wallpaper. I'm really interested in that one. <laughs> um, to register for either uh, of these events, you can email director at rojamlibrary.org because we partner with our fellow libraries on these. Or you can contact us and we can help you get signed up too. And more information is on the History Room website and the library website. The History Room Committee of the Library hosts our local history speaker series, which offers free monthly talks on diverse topics related to local history. And we are pleased to collaborate on this evening's program with the Greenport Historical Society and the Fascinating Museum of Firefighting. Uh, and I'm going to welcome tonight's speaker now. Lauren Suzuki, who will be speaking with us tonight about the current Fascinating Museum exhibit titled Forged by Fire, The Life and Legacy of Harry Howard, which is on display through June 2023. Lauren is the Assistant Curator at the Fascinating Museum of Firefighting in Hudson, New York. She recently curated two new exhibits that celebrate the 200th birthday of Chief Harry Howard and the 150th anniversary of the Firefighters Association of the State of New York, Fascinating. Lauren graduated from SUNY Potsdam in 2019 with a bachelor's degree in archaeological studies and minors in history, anthropology, and museum studies. That's a lot of majors. <laughs> and minors. <laughs> Lauren's other historical interests include maritime history of the 20th and 21st century. Uh, so without further ado, welcome Lauren. Well, 
Uh, this past August marked his 200th birthday. <laughs> yeah. um, and actually, as part of our exhibit opening, we pretty much wanted to have a party for Harry. So we had birthday cake available, and we even did pin the mustache on Harry, which was a hit. Um, Harry's also a legend, and he's developed quite the legacy in Hudson and beyond. And here at the museum, we consider him to be the GOAT, or the greatest of all time. <coughs> so through this exhibit, we really wanted to showcase Harry's story and show why he should still be celebrated um, even on his 200th birthday and beyond. So in terms of Harry's early life, I found this article from the Fireman's Herald in 1896 that um, has a quote right from Harry that I think is the most authentic uh, recollection of his earliest years. And actually, I think he wants to say it himself today. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it reads, I was a family, or rather was abandoned by my mother soon after I was born in Manhattanville. I came into the world, according to the records, on August 20th, 1822. When I was a few weeks old, my mother took me to the home of Miss Sarah Charlesworth Howard, gave $300 to the lady, and said that she would call for me in the spring. Seventy springs have come and gone, and she has not called for me yet, and I never shall see her, at least in this world. Miss Howard was my mother's nurse when I was born, and her opinion was that my mother died soon afterwards. Miss Howard did not believe that my mother intended to abandon me, as apparently she was a woman of needs. What limited education I have, I picked up in the only school I ever attended, and it was a Sunday school. Miss Howard was poor and could not afford to give me schooling, and I worked from boyhood to manhood. She was very good to me and became in every way a foster mother. I never can forget her tenderness, and I have tried to show my gratitude to her by erecting to her memory a monument over her grave in Greenwood Cemetery. When I was old enough, I was apprenticed to Abijah Matthews, a cabinet maker at Henry and Catherine Streets, for 11 years. In 1839, I completed my apprenticeship, gave my work bench and tools to a poor cabinet maker, walked out of the shop, and never worked at my trade. Thank you, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Harry likely gave up his cabinetry career in favor of a hobby he discovered in 1835, and that hobby was firefighting. So, Harry, in 1835, he was a teenager at this time, and he decided to run with Peterson Engine number 15. And if you're not familiar with the term running or runners in terms of firefighting, that means that Harry was a young boy, wasn't old enough to join as a firefighter. So he ran ahead of the firefighters and their apparatus with a torch, much like these, to light and clear the way for the firefighters. So Harry's official firefighting career began in 1840 when he became a firefighter with Peterson Engine number 15, and that's when he received this certificate here, which is on display as part of the exhibit. So he continued to volunteer with Peterson, and he moved up the ranks from fireman to assistant foreman and foreman, and he worked with this engine here, known as the Old Maid probably because it was very old, but I think I read that they used it for quite a, quite a long time. In 1851, he began to volunteer with Atlantic Coast, company number 14, as a foreman. Okay. So, the next few years were very busy for Harry because in addition to serving as foreman of Atlantic Coast, he became the assistant engineer of the New York City Volunteer Fire Department. An assistant engineer is pretty much equivalent to today's assistant chief. So, um, he also served in many political and economic offices in his community during this time, including assemblyman, alderman, and receiver of taxes. Mm -hmm. But despite all this, he managed his firefighting duties with ease. He actually set up a strategic headquarters at the Tombs Prison so that he would get first word from the telegraph that they had there of a fire call and so he could get to fire calls really quickly. It was also during this time as assistant engineer that he made a very heroic rescue of the Jennings Clothing Store fire. And this is an event that I mentioned in the exhibit. How 
However, as part of the exhibit opening, I created a short presentation kind of elaborating on this, and I'd like to share it with you today as well. So the Jennings Clothing Store was located in, on Broadway in New York City, and it was owned by William T. Jennings, and according to this newspaper advertisement, he was a tailor, and a, he sold fine men's clothing. So on April 25th, 1854, some thieves snuck into his building, stole property, and set his building on fire. And the fire did spread to the surrounding buildings, but the structural issues that firefighters were faced with at the Jennings Clothing Store are of particular note. The back wall of the building was constructed with a large metal arch that began to glow red hot with the immense heat of the flames. And when the water from the firefighters' hoses hit this metal, the, the arch collapsed and the whole back wall collapsed as well. And without the support of the back wall, many of the floors of the building also collapsed, bringing with it a large heavy safe that was on one of the upper floors. So all of this debris ended up trapping and killing 11 firemen, and Sam Van Prague, a young boy, was also trapped under the safe and the debris. And as anyone would do in this situation, began crying out for help. So meanwhile, Harry Howard, the star of this exhibit, was working outside as assistant engineer, no doubt taking orders from the chief engineer and relaying them to the firemen at the scene. So when he heard Sam's cries for help, he decided to enter the building and save Sam. And he did this despite knowing that many firemen had already passed and that it was a very dangerous situation. Um, he was successful in saving Sam, and Sam went on to live a very successful life. And many years later, he stopped by Harry's house himself to leave him a little note saying thank you. So that's pretty cool. So also on display in the exhibit is this lithograph, this 1857 lithograph here. Um, if you look in the bottom left-hand corner, there is a rendition of the Jennings Clothing Store fire. So the inclusion of this scene in a lithograph of Harry Howard just goes to show how important Harry was to this event. And I'll also point out that this is one of the pieces we got conserved. And it was conserved at the Williamstown Art Conservation Center. And I actually had the opportunity to bring it to and from conservation. And you can bet the whole time I was very white knuckled on the screen. <laughs> um, but in any case, it came back, it looks really great. The frame is very different than how it originally looked. Okay. So in 1857, Harry was promoted to chief engineer. And because of this promotion, Harry had to resign as receiver of taxes. And when he had to resign, he requested that his, all of the work that he completed as receiver of taxes be verified, um, just to make sure it was 100% correct. He was surely prompted by all the corruption going on during this time in the area. And this just goes to show how much of an honest person Harry was. <coughs> so this is his helmet that he wore as chief engineer and this helmet, his chief engineer helmet front. We have it at the museum on display and it's also been conserved. You'll notice that the helmet is white and that's because chiefs wear white helmets so they're easily recognizable at a fire scene. We also have this image here, which shows him with his assistant engineers. So Harry's in the middle, and he's surrounded by his assistants. And this piece is also concerned as well. And they're both on display as part of the exhibit. As chief engineer, Harry instituted the bunking system, which means, which it's a policy that mandates firefighters sleep at the firehouse so that they can quickly respond to fire calls. And certainly has resulted in a lot of lives and property saved. Unfortunately, his great dedication to the fire service had a negative impact on his health, and he began to suffer from paralysis. In fact, his first instance of paralysis happened on the way to a fire call as chief engineer. And eventually, in 1860, he was forced to retire entirely. So, now retired from firefighting, Harry was working as the inspector of vaults and areas, and I tried to think about or research what this job entailed, and I didn't really find much. Um, I guess, I, I would assume that it was someone who inspected like construction areas, but if anyone has any other ideas, I'd love to hear. So Harry joined the Exempt Firemen's Association because his heart 
part still remained with firefighting. And as you can see, he's pictured here with them. He's to the left with a speaking trumpet. And he also participated in lots and lots of parades. And he was very adamant about being in parades. Um, and you can imagine that with his paralysis condition, that probably wasn't an easy thing to do. But nonetheless, he did it. He also, throughout his life, advocated for a paid fire department in New York City. And when it was instituted in 1865, he further advocated or lobbied for uh, higher salaries. And he was successful in doing that, too. In 1885, he donated to the exempt burial, exempt fireman's burial fund, he donated $1,000. And his donation was accompanied by this letter, which reads, Dear Sir, while a cabinet maker's apprentice and Sunday school boy, I earned a little donation intended for the exempt fireman's burial fund, which has now grown to be the enclosed $1,000. Very respectfully, Harry Howard. <laughs> And then in 1890, he donated another $1,000 to the Fasney Fireman's Home, which is right here in Hudson, New York. And here's an image of the home on its grand opening in 1892. And this building does not, does no longer exist. We're currently on the third iteration of the building that was built in 2007. Um, so $1,000 at that time was a lot of money for a public servant. And today it would be equivalent to $30,000. So between the exempt fireman's burial fund and the fireman's home, Harry gave $60,000 in today's money. So these are some later life images of Harry. You can see he's rocking the stash. <laughs> uh, so this one on the far left was circa 1890. The middle was uh, 1893, and then this one was 1894. Unfortunately, Harry contracted pneumonia in 1896 and passed away at the age of 73. So some people might say, why are we still talking about Harry Howard? In fact, someone walked by my exhibit and said, what's so special about Harry Howard? <laughs> and I really just wanted to tell them. But, uh, so Harry, his accomplishments and his philanthropy have left behind a lot of long-lasting benefits that affect us today. For instance, the bunking system is still used in New York State and continues to preserve life and property. Some may say that his advocacy for fair wages for career firefighters makes it so that today's career firefighters are paid a fair salary. And the Fireman's Home is still active here and still working here in Hudson, New York. It's now known as the Firefighter's Home, um, right here on Perry Howard Avenue. Yeah, it's right next to the museum. And I think it's fair to say that his story is pretty inspirational. I mean, it certainly inspires me to live my life more like Harry with his values. And it makes sense that a lot of communities have decided to name their fire companies and their landmarks after Harry, just like Harry Howard Avenue. And on display as part of this exhibit, we have a lot of pieces that represent those namesakes. For example, we have a helmet from Harry Howard Hose and a little badge from Harry Howard Hook and Ladder. And then we have a engine condenser panel from Howard Engine number 34, this engine here. So the engine panels would have covered the pumping mechanism on a pumper. And oftentimes they were very elaborate. They had gray paintings on them. So all of these are on display as part of the exhibit. So that concludes my overview of the Forged by Fire, the life and legacy of Harry Howard. I hope that you'll come to the museum to visit yourself, and I hope that you'll find some inspiration from the story. Well, I'd love to tell you about our museum. It's located on Harry Howard Avenue, right next to the Fat Environments Home. We're open Wednesday through Sunday from 10 a.m. to 4.30, and we have over 50,000 square feet of New York State firefighting history. We have 60 apparatus on display, ranging from hand pumpers like the Newsham pumper right here, which is actually New York State's first fire engine. It fought fires for 154 years. It came over to America on a ship called the Beaver in 1725. Yeah. And then we have steamers such as this one, which is which was manufactured by Clapp and Jones right here in Hudson, New York. And then we have motorized apparatus like this one from Catskill 
We also have artwork, badges, uh, firefighting gear and tools in our collections. And we currently have on display a temporary exhibit that was unveiled on the 20th anniversary of 9-11 and features artifacts from Ground Zero on loan from the New York State Museum in Albany. In addition to our interactive exhibits, we have lots of other education programs available. We give tours to people of all ages. There I am up there. Uh, and then our awesome educator, Kathy, who's here with me today, she educates um, people of all ages with firefighting safety and history through her multiple personas. We've got Firefighter Fran, we've got Professor Sparks, and Fiona Flanagan, which is her newest little character. And of course, we have Molly the Museum Dog, which is our museum mascot, and she's a Dalmatian. Uh, she is a certified therapy dog, so she can go with Kathy to schools and to the fireman's home, firefighter's home. And she also teaches fire safety because she knows how to stop, drop, and roll, how uh, to get low and go when they're small. <laughs> and she's one of my favorite coworkers. <laughs> uh, one of our most popular offerings is our Super Saturday programs, which are free events that we do once a month. And each month there's a different theme. So some examples here, we have uh, Greenport. We had them come and do a uh, vehicle extraction demonstration. We have our ever popular Dalmatian Day. This past year we had 30 Dalmatians and we were given toys and prizes and we had food and activities going on. Then we have our Princess and Protectors Tea Party where we have female firefighters come in and princes and princesses can talk to them over a cup of tea. And Mini Horse Mania where we talk about the historical significance of horses and firefighting. And our most our upcoming Super Saturday event is all about Smokey Bear. It's on November 19th. And Kathy, our educator, has planned all of that out, so she knows more about that. So I'm going to give it over to her to kind of explain what you can expect that day. Sure. So we have Smokey, the big man himself, is coming. Um, Ranger Gullen, who's a New York State DEC forest, fires, forest, forest ranger, is coming. Uh, he'll have his equipment. He'll talk about for, forest fires in New York. And we have sky hunters in flight with, they're going to bring owls, falcons, and hawks, and they're going to live fly them around the museum. Right. <laughs> so it should be fun. And wildfire safety. Okay. And that's all I have. I just want to say thank you again to you all for coming and for the Hudson Area Library and Greenport Historical Society for having me here. And of course, my coworkers who are always so awesome. So if you have more questions, I'd be happy to take more questions. But if not, thank you for coming. Thank you. Is that Samuel? The picture on the, the condenser, condenser panel. Was that so a picture? This is um, actually a philanthropist who also had the last name Howard. I believe his first name was John, I forget off the top of my head, but he was a prison reformer. And I just found it kind of interesting that they chose to put a philanthropist Howard on the engine of, named after Harry Howard, who's kind of like likening them and their um, philanthropic pursuits. So, yeah. Mm. And I think from, we can tell from the wear and tear on that condenser panel that that is the original. Yeah. Uh, I'm Guy Episol, I'm the newly elected president of the Greenport Historical Society. <laughs> and I wanted to thank FASNI and the library for inviting us to collaborate with this fascinating program. Mm -hmm. uh, I also want to say we have our annual holiday luncheon at Kozel's next Thursday at noontime. So I'd like to invite you. It's $25 a person, but it's well worth it. And uh, we have a speaker, Ron Gabriel. He's going to talk about the Second Battle of Gettysburg. So you're all invited next Thursday at noontime at Kozel's. Thanks again. Thank you. Great, great presentation. Uh, what, is the, what is the arrangement? Uh, you have the Fireman's Retirement Home. Yeah. Uh, how does one get in there? Is this something uh, that is a benefit of being a fireman? Is it free or is it for 
families or single firemen? What's the deal with that? So I know in order to get admitted, you have to have been a long term firefighter in your state for at least one year. And they also admit home member spouses and auxiliary members. Um, and in terms of, is it free? I don't, I don't think it's free. I think there's um, a certain program that has passed my knowledge about that. Um, but it's not free. It's not free. Um, I think they currently have maybe 90 people there. 80, 80 to 90. They have space for 80 members. Space for 80 members. Yeah. If you're looking for somebody to go in there, I would contact the director. Mm -hmm. Department of the Navy director. If you need like a letter from whatever fire department, the person going in there is. I see. No, it was more of a curiosity <laughs> because it's uh, yeah, it's got a unique mm -hmm. from what I've seen. So I actually, always, I, always, I, always wonder what what the deal with it was. Yeah, actually, the museum is a separate entity mm -hmm. than Fasting Fire Patrol. You know, it's under the Fasting Foundation, mm -hmm. so it's. Um, it has its own board and uh, own budget and stuff like that. Whereas Fireman's Home is under FASD, which is under the FASD Foundation. Mm -hmm. yeah, so. Thank you. That is our board president, Neil Van Dusen. <laughs> 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 Thank you very much. Uh, I'm curious if you know the, um, like in the country or the state, like how, what percentage of firefighters are volunteer versus Okay, like until I moved to Hudson, I didn't know that one could volunteer as a firefighter. I don't know. Uh, well, I know we have this statistic in the museum. I know it's in the 70s. 75% of New York State firefighters are volunteers. Without knowing the percentage, I don't know. Yeah. Hudson, I don't know if it's a fire department also. In the Hudson Fire Department for the volunteer organization, it's the oldest in New York State. Oldest act of New York State, 1794, was founded. And uh, whereas it wasn't the first fire department in New York State, uh, New York City, um, Albany, I think Kingston had fire departments before that, but they don't exist in the same form and they don't look at their volunteer history. You know? so. One thing that's really cool at Farmers Home is, I don't know if you've been there, um, there's an old cemetery behind it, the new building. Purpose building here, and those are the original NY. It was the NYFD, which was a volunteer, and became the FDNY, which exists today. But the members in that old museum are all the New York City Volunteer Fire Department. You look at the headstones, and it gives the little towns that they grew up in, in Brooklyn and Queens and stuff. It's, it's really, really cool to see. And they were the ones, for the most part, that did not get a job with the FDNY when the FDNY replaced the NYFD. And so they Became residents of Hudson and the Farmer's Home. Yeah. It's, it's really cool. And um, New York State does have, um, there is like, you know, for the country, a percentage of um, firefighters that are volunteer. And New York definitely um, is one of the highest percentages of volunteers. So that's something to be really proud of. Columbia County, Green County are all volunteer. Mm -hmm. I have a question that I need to address the council. The local uh, fire department staffs are, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm a member of the Greenport Historical Society, Good. and we're researching a fire from 1907. Is there a historian with the local fire departments? How do they do, how, what now, kind of archives would there be? Uh, Pat Fenoff, who just recently yeah, got yeah, she, she knew about the fire department, the fire department did. Okay. And her daughter, I think. Linda. Linda, yeah. Linda okay. would be the one who approach on that. Okay, it's Doric Hall, if anyone knows about the 1907 fire. <laughs> we're in Hudson? Or? Yes, it was, well, it was, it's Green Park. Okay. 1907, Doric Hall burned to the ground. It was a, quite an estate before any other housing was on that road. Mm -hmm. So I have someone just trying it to was, research you, that. Green Park didn't have an organized fire protection. So I would imagine Hudson. That's what I was guessing. Uh, I don't know if Florida existed, you know. So no, what was it on? Green and The last family that owned it, their last name was Green. So there's well, this. Jocelyn. Track. Yeah. Track. Yeah. 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 So I'm, I'm actually trying to research the house. 
the fire is off. Also, if you want to talk to me afterwards, I can take some notes and I can look through our our collections for anything about that as well. Yeah, I love stuff like that. <laughs>